Welcome, good evening. We are in the second week of the Trek Spring Courses, and it is an honor and it's a privilege to have a dear brother and friend with me this evening, Dr. Robert Plummer. And uh, Dr. Plummer, you may not know this, but I'll share with you a personal story to start off this evening as we get going. But uh, after 15, 20 years in the business world, my first course at Master of Divinity at Southern Seminary was with you. And I took the hermeneutics course as a modular course uh, in 2014, the fall of 2014. And you were teaching hermeneutics and I was staying at the Legacy Hotel on the campus. And I remember the way the format is uh, for those who have not done modular courses is you do some online and then you go to campus for a few days and then you and then you finish the remainder of the course online. And uh, Dr. Plummer, uh, when I started that course, I wasn't actually sure if I could go back to school after all those years and make it, uh, which was a little stressful, to be honest with you. I, I knew I could do some things in the business world, but that was, that was hard. Uh, and I remember the first day taking class with you. It was recorded sessions. And I remember coming home off of one of the train trips or whatever I was doing. And turning to Don and saying, this professor is fabulous. I mean, he is able to take complex things in a way and make them learnable for me at a, at a pace. And I, I have, I'm just muting a few microphones while I'm talking. I'm sorry. Uh, and, I, uh, and, I, and I gained confidence through your teaching, which was uh, just such a, I'm so thankful that you were able to uh, um, convey your information in such a way. I didn't mean to mute you though, Dr. Plummer, there we go. So uh, I, that, was, that was a real blessing to me and you served me and, and really gave me a sense of confidence that I needed at that point in my life. And, and uh, after, after the class was done, I'm gonna give you a shameless plug here, but there's a book here and I'm gonna hold it up. We included this um, called The 40 Questions About Interpreting the Bible. And you wrote a note of this for me. You may not realize this, but uh, after the class was done, I bought this book for all of the people in my small group. And we were, we were leading a small group in Canada, uh, and I was discipling a few men in the small group personally. And your note to me, I've always kept it because it meant so much. It says, to Chris, honored to spend the time with you in hermeneutics. May the Lord bless you, Rob Plummer. And then when the course was finished, you sent out this card to all of us. Turn the video off. And I've kept these two beside me all the way through this journey uh, from way back in 2014 to today. And uh, I've struggled through Greek with you. You've been patient with me. Uh, and you are an unbelievably gifted uh, scholar, professor, and uh, even better than that, you care about the people in your class. Um, one of the things I watched and, and personally was how you took creative mnemonic devices, how you took singing the Greek alphabet and different things and, and were able to lock in the complex things in a way that people like I that have a very short retention span were able to keep in my mind. And really, when, when I look back at my career or my time at the seminary, uh, you were hugely formative, not just at the beginning, but all the way through it, how you treated me and how you treated others. And I remember one class you said to us, my goal, and I wanna to read to you something that I, that I captured. You said that, you're, that you want your life and your character to authenticate uh, the teaching that you gave us as students, not just, a, not just a digital download to us as students, but rather that we would love God's word more and read God's word better as a result of our time with you. And I'm paraphrasing the last, but boy, did it, it was absolutely what you accomplished in my life. And uh, so I'm thrilled that you're with us tonight. Yeah. Thrilled I'm that you're with us as I'm well next so week. And, so um, I'll just I'm get whoever's, I'll just so mute a few I'm more microphones. I'm sorry, here we go. Yes. There's still more coming on, so this is good. I'm going to open with prayer, but before I do, let me just give a brief background as to your academia and your professor beyond my personal attesting uh, to your character and your abilities. So Dr. Plummer, Dr. Robert Plummer, is a professor of New Testament interpretation at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, where Don and I moved uh, not but three months ago. 
or so. Dr. Plummer is a biblical scholar with a missionary heart. Um, and there's lots in here I could touch on, but I'm only going to hit on a few points. Dr. Plummer reads, studies, talks, and writes about the Bible. Um, Jesus, you wrote here, and I'll, I'll read this. This is great for your bio, but I love it. He says, Jesus told his adversaries, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you have eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. And Plummer adds, the joy of studying the scriptures is that through them we hear the voice of the living God and gaze with wonder on Messiah Jesus and the sufficiency of his atoning death. When you're not busy teaching Greek and New Testament, and many other things you are at home uh, in your primary uh, role of serving your family. And we've had the pleasure of meeting uh, your wonderful wife and your three beautiful daughters. And it has been a joy to, to see how you have ministered to them. Your wife is gifted. Your daughters are gifted. Uh, one of the videos called Behind the Bowtie, which Dr. Plummer, they, they got sort of a day with you and spent time with cameras in your life. And I remember watching you holding your daughters at the end of the day and playing and laughing. And uh, uh, for all the seriousness that you do during the day, uh, there's also the silly, which I'm thankful for. Both. And uh, you are uh, just an absolute, uh, it's a joy. Very few people have I had a time to introduce in my life that I've been more excited to introduce than you tonight. So with that, I'm going to open with some prayer. We're going to turn it to you to walk us through interpreting the Bible. The book that I held up, 40 questions about interpreting the Bible, if you don't have it, I would say it's a must-buy for everybody. So 40 questions about interpreting the Bible. Uh, tonight, won't be going through those chapter by chapter. Rather, it's taking the content of that book and putting it into sort of a, a teaching style that will help lock in some of the principles of the book in seven images, if I've said it correctly. Uh, but let me open with prayer, and then I'll turn it to you because that's why we're here. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for Dr. Plum and for every single person that has taken time away from other things this evening to join us for this two-part session on interpreting the Bible. We know that our, our hope from these sessions is that we're not drawn to a person, but we're drawn to the Creator. We're drawn to, to love your word deeper, know it better, understand it, so that we can either teach it to others or understand it better ourselves in our hearts and our minds, so that we grow in our love and our passion for Jesus Christ, God the Father and the Holy Spirit. We are so thankful for this time. We pray that it is a time that builds you up and, and, and is a time that, that truly helps your people to be better, to equipped, to be equipped, to understand your word. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Dr. Plummer, I will mute myself. It's over to you. We will follow this with some questions at the end at roughly seven o'clock. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. That was very, very, very kind introduction, brother. Very kind of you. Um, it is an honor to join you guys. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. I'll probably be in like a little square up in the corner here, but let me share my screen. And we're going to be working through this PowerPoint in just a minute. I assume you can hear me, Chris. Everything's good coming through. Great. Okay. Well, um, we're all sick of the pandemic. I'm, I'm sick of the pandemic too, but I guess we can be grateful because I probably wouldn't be able to visit with you guys uh, if this were not the case. I mean, I, I doubt I'd be traveling up to Toronto at this point in the semester. We have final exams this next week. Um, but what we're here to talk about tonight is about reading, interpreting, understanding the Bible. And as Chris already very eloquently said, we're, we're doing this so that when we're teaching others, we can be faithful. We, we can teach responsibly. We can not misinterpret God's word, but even devotionally, even when we're reading the word uh, for ourselves, we want, we want to hear what God wants us to learn from, from the scriptures. Now, as I was glancing at some of your pictures when you're coming on, we have people of all different ages here. I imagine some of you have been reading and even teaching the scriptures for decades. So it's not likely that I'm going to teach you anything new tonight. 
But I'll, I'll make an analogy to like when I go to my daughter's track practice, I have two daughters that run track and one of them that runs cross country. And when I go there, um, I mean, I'm a runner too, and I've been running since I was in you know, seventh grade or something, but, but I hear the coach and I, I, he says things that I know that I, I, I'm reminded of. I'm like, oh yeah, I need to think about that. I, I, need to, I need to not just rush after I finish running. I need to stretch out that way. I need to warm up that way. And so I'm hopeful that even for those of you with many decades of experience in the scriptures, that what I say tonight will be some helpful reminders. Now, what we're going to use, as Chris mentioned, we're going to use a mnemonic method. I have it titled here on the screen, Interpretive Essentials, Seven Key Images. And this is the way that ancient people, many ancient people, memorize things using visualization. And it's been rediscovered in recent years. Maybe you've watched the BBC show Sherlock, and Sherlock has uh, mind palaces, and you, you, you thought that was all... Uh, maybe made up, but that actually is a very real thing. And what you do is you need a structure that you're familiar with. For example, your house, an apartment, um, a, a place where you work that, that has at least, say, four or five rooms. Uh, because what we're going to do is we're going to walk through that structure. You're going to walk through that structure, and you're, we're going to place images throughout that structure, striking and unusual images, that will help us to remember the essentials of interpretation. Now, the benefit of this is rather than some list of things that we can't remember, we have a mental filing cabinet, a visual filing cabinet that will enable us to go back and walk through that structure and remember essential things that we want to do when we're reading, studying, and teaching the Bible. I, I adopted this method a number of years ago. I think I, I adopted it very uh, right before um, Chris took uh, hermeneutics with me many years ago after I read the book Moonwalking with Einstein. This is a real book. <laughs> it sounds strange. Moonwalking with Einstein by Joshua Four. And he was a New York Times reporter, and he, he got into reporting on the competitive memory circuit. And maybe you've seen this in the news every couple of years. They'll have people who can memorize a deck of cards in like 90 seconds. And he, and he thought, well, these people are just, you know, some sort of, you know, savants. They're, they're just not normal people. They're, they're born where they can just memorize things super fast. But they told him, we're just like you. We just have effective methods using visualization uh, to do this, creating visual images tied with numbers and suits and the card and so on card deck of cards so he he got into it and actually won the national memory competition using visualization then wrote a book about it so so are you ready so you need to have have a structure your house place of office something like that and we're going to start putting images in it okay for me i'm choosing my house and when i walk into the first room that may be a different room for you for where whatever you're doing just something you're very familiar with it's um uh i'm i'm going to put in there as i walk in uh, I'm going to put things that remind me about prayer, because the first essential thing when we approach the word of God is to approach it in prayer. And so but but the way visualization and memory works is the more striking and unusual the image, the more uh, memorable it is. So for me, like I would put a disco ball in the foyer, which I don't have a disco ball in my foyer in my house usually. And the disco ball is projecting prayer hands on the wall. You know, and then maybe I have I have grandma there and 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 look, she's got a prayer tattoo and I never realized grandma was quite that muscular, you know, and and so, you know, I've got a prayer tattoo. I've got prayer hands on the wall. Maybe if you're a child of the 80s, you have MC Hammer in the background. You got to pray just to make it today. Right. You've got all these different things that are reminding you about the essential uh, of beginning interpreting the Bible with prayer. Martin Luther, uh, when he talked about, he wrote this famous essay that's the preface to the Wittenberg edition of his German writings. And it's, it's basically like how to be a theologian, how to be someone who thinks and writes and talks accurately about God. And uh, he's, he's, you know, Luther is very provocative in everything he says. And he says, if you follow my advice, you'll write books better than the church fathers. And he said, you know, I've written some that are better than the church fathers. And so this is his method. It's oratio, meditatio, tentatio. And the reason I'm bringing it up, he's, he's, he, it's prayer, Latin prayer, meditation, 
and trials. And we're going we're gonna to talk more about this later, but we're beginning with the first one is prayer. And the reason he gets us, he just draws it straight from Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the Bible. It's 176 verses. And there are three motifs that reappear throughout the psalm, prayer, meditation, and then difficulties that the psalmist face, faces. And, and Luther, I think, rightly points out, this is the psalm that teaches us how to approach God's word. Psalm 119 is about God's word. And so over and over again, uh, I've had students in the past, one, one assignment I give them, I say, I want you to classify every verse in that psalm as a prayer verse, a meditation verse, or a trial verse. And in doing that, they're struck by how many dozens and scores of verses relate to this. We're just going to look at a few ourselves. The point being, why do we start approaching the scripture with prayer? It's because that is the method that God has given us himself in his word. He's teaching us. The Psalms are like a father reaching down to a child and saying, say, father say daddy say daddy and the child repeats daddy daddy and so the psalms are like that this is god giving us words to respond back to him and i want to look at some some of the petitions in the psalms so in psalm 119 5 we see uh the psalmist here david cries out oh that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees right calling out to god we're going to see not just for understanding, but for an obedient response for hearts that lean towards the teaching of scripture that we would desire to obey it. And then we would have strength by the Holy Spirit to obey that teaching. Psalm 119.10. These are just some randomly chosen verses from the beginning of the psalm that, that are prayers. And the psalmist says, David says, I seek you with all my heart. Now, again, as, as we I, one, one suggestion I would have for you is you go through Psalm 119 with a highlighter and highlight some of these. And before you begin preparing a Sunday school lesson, before you begin your morning devotions, take a few minutes to read these as prayers to God. And as you do that, don't just do it like a rote thing, but be real about it. So if you're reading verse 10 here, I seek you with all my heart, you may need to pause there. And it's a moment for confession. And to say, God, I, I don't seek you with all my heart, as the psalmist says. I seek after security. I seek after comfort. I seek after many different things. But God, I want to seek you with all my heart. God, forgive me for seeking other things. And it says, do not let me stray from your commands. It's like, God, hold me tightly to your word. Let me be stuck to your commands so that they, they, they're stuck down deep in my heart and soul and mind. Psalm 119, 12, praise be to you, Lord, teach me your decrees, right? Many, many of us, maybe uh, if we're preparing a Sunday school lesson, we're diligently looking at the Sunday school material. We're reading commentaries. Maybe we listen to teachers uh, on a podcast. And those are all good things. God raises up human teachers in the church, but the best teacher, the best teacher is God himself, God's Holy Spirit teaching us. And we need to call out. He wants it. He's given us the model in Psalm 119, calling out to God, praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. Teach me your decrees. We'll look at a few others of these. I'm just, again, I, if we had time, we could probably, don't worry, we're not going to do this. <laughs> if we had time, we could probably take an hour on, on just thinking about prayer. But I just want to show you how prominent this motif is in Psalm 119. And, and I also want to want to encourage you, if you're, if you're prone to dismiss it, you're like, okay, check prayer, then maybe that's a warning too, because you need to realize, wait, this is an essential step in interpretation to get down on my knees to open the Bible, open Psalm 119, or, or, or even just out of the overflow of your heart, the scripture that's been planted in there, to call out to God. Let me read here from Psalm 119, verse 17 and following. Be good to your servant while I live, that I may obey your word. Open my eyes, that I may see wonderful things in your law. I want you to look especially that petition, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. 
where what the psalmist is praying for and what we're praying for is to see things in the scripture it's not praying for some sort of extra biblical revelation to come flying in some visions and dreams and extra biblical but to see what is there and to submit to it to 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 joyfully understand it and respond with worship and obedience i've given the analogy to classes in the past it's sort of like if you imagine in the caribbean that's a nice thought right now if we could travel to the caribbean <laughs> and imagine we're a part of a treasure seeking group we're 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 trying to dive down and and find uh, sunken ships from the 17 and 1800s and recover piles of gold right so we have we have two different groups that are doing this one of them representing those who are metaphorically led by the spirit in prayer and the other one's just human powered and they're looking at the same thing they're looking at the 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 way the the light is playing on the sand on the bottom of the sea the same data is in front of them but one group is saying hey i'm looking at that and i i see i see that light i think that's that's gold down there and i'm gonna die for it right there's there's a the assessment of it and then there's the action that, that responds the other group is looking at it and saying well yeah that's just the light reflecting on the sand now what we're what we're what the analogy is we want to god's opening our mind and eyes to see what's really there like the gold and then to act upon it to dive to 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 take action uh through our minds and bodies and choices um that shows that that we're valuing things and seeing things as god would have us to looking looking there in verse 19 says i am a stranger on the earth do not hide your commands from me my soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times and again this this psalm is an invitation where we might say god i confess my my soul is not consumed with longing for your laws at all times my here's a list of things i confess my soul is consumed with and god i i need you to forgive me because i'm valuing i'm not <laughs> The, the treasure is still hidden in the field. The pearl of great price is in the marketplace and I'm out trying to buy other stuff. I want to help me to value you and your kingdom above all these other gifts we have in this world. Finally, Psalm 119 verses 34 through 37. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain turn my eyes away from worthless things and preserve my life according to your word uh, we don't have i'm gonna cut this next part a little bit short but depending on when i have a little more time with people i'll talk a little more broadly about prayer and um you know it's possible you say okay i understand this i'm i've got a sunday school lesson to prepare I've, i'm gonna i'm gonna pray god give me understanding but but sometimes when we go to god in prayer his his response to us is thank you for coming to me <laughs> there's something i need you to deal with before i answer that petition right because god is a loving father who's not in the business of making religious hypocrites right he doesn't just want to make you into a very effective religious hypocrite and so in first peter 3 7 again maybe there's some wives who are poking their elbows into their husbands at this point it says husbands in the same way be considerate as you live with your wives of course that's true that wives should live considerately with husbands too and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers the point i have in citing that is that i want you to see that that god is in the business again and not ma making us into religious hypocrites but making us into sons and daughters who reflect his image and so when we come to him saying god give me understanding of your word we're quiet before him we're listening to him a prompting that he may give us is i want you to go make things right with this person that you have wronged i want you to repent of this sin that i'm calling to your mind and then i'm eager to give you understanding into the scriptures but but let's 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 deal with this other matter be like if i'm driving along and my daughters say i have two daughters in the back they're teenagers now and they get um they get angry and are yelling at each other messing with each other and then one of them yells dairy queen i'm like yeah let's all get ice cream right no i don't i say i need you <laughs> no 
No, we're not going to Dairy Queen right now because you guys need to repent of the way you're speaking and acting towards each other. That's what takes place over dealing with the petition that you have for me. Similarly, Jesus warned at, his, at the end of this great teaching uh, on what we call the Lord's Prayer. He says, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Again, if you've experienced the grace and forgiveness of God, it's inevitable It's it's a, it's a that God says that has to flow out of you. And if it doesn't, it calls into question whether you really know him. If you're an unforgiving and unloving person, how can you know the God who is loving and forgiving? And so this, this passage reminds us that God calls us to be loving, forgiving, to be walking with him. So then when we call out to him in prayer, uh, we can expect our Heavenly Father, our, our communion with Him to not be interrupted. So the first room, again, then you have the mnemonic device, we have the structure, we walk in, just to remind you, and the, all the reminders are prayer. We got the disco ball with the prayer hands on the wall. You got grandma maybe bending down there with a huge prayer tattoo on her arm. You never never knew, you know, what that she, she took that trip to the circus when she was 17 and got the prayer tattoo that she's hidden for all these years under that shawl. Are you, you hear MC Hammer in the background, you got to pray, right? It's a reminder, if we're not slowing down and asking God, oh Lord, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things in your word, then we're not following the biblical pattern of approaching the word of God. When I go into the next room, which is the living room for me, it has this sort of atrocious, um, <laughs> just all over the walls it has these images right it's 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 very stark <laughs> this is not stylish decorating right here but we have all these images of different sports you have horseback riding you have judo you have soccer you have uh, look there's even curling there i think that guy is curling uh on the second column on uh, on from the right third down i don't know that maybe that's curling and and the point is that all these different sports have different rules you have to follow and and you need to know the rules of the game if i if i were to go out here on the lawn i don't know if people call soccer soccer or football and i think you call it soccer i don't know in canada but if they're always international students playing soccer out there so if i were to go out there and say hey well i play soccer can i play soccer with you guys they'd, they'd say sure because they're nice and i'm a professor and they would feel like they were obligated to but if I get get out there and then I just start picking up the ball and throwing it to people, <laughs> I was like, no, 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 you can't do that, uh, Dr. Plummer. That's not how you play soccer. That's not the rules of this game. And just like sports have rules and you have to abide by them, there, the Bible has different genres of literature. Okay, the Bible is uh, is really a small library, right? It's it's a library with sixty six different books, and the authors who wrote those books they um they are uh they, they wrote them with the assumption that the readers would read them uh, according to certain patterns of understanding right Th that's there are certain assumptions and those assumptions come out at points and so understanding the genre of the literature is very important for interpreting it accurately let's just step back for a second and talk a little more slowly about this when I say genre, I'm really just talking about the kind of literature that we have. And before we talk about the genres of literature in the Bible, let's try to understand genre in our own time and culture, just as a step towards that. So let's say you're at the public library and you walk by a room and you hear somebody say once upon a time. That's all you hear. Just hearing that, you you assume rightly, I think, that there's someone is telling um, some sort of a a fairy tale right it probably has fantastical creatures like dragons and unicorns maybe some challenge to be overcome uh, probably a happy ending it's probably directed at small children both for enjoyment and for moral instruction we're very familiar with the genre of a fairy tale and even the introductory words that cue us that that is what is happening or let's say tonight after, as i drive home I, maybe we forgot to get the mail in our mailbox and I stop and grab it and there's a letter I open it they've misspelled my name right this happens in these sorts of letters that uh, they dropped an m there and it says Mr Plummer you have just won 10 million dollars well of course I haven't won 10 million dollars this this is a 
some sort of a marketing ploy to get me to buy magazines, right? This is, I'm familiar, I assume you have something similar in Canada, you know what this is. Uh, we, know, we know that genre. Uh, or one of my daughters, school is tomorrow, and she says, Dad, I'm so depressed. I have a ton of homework. At that point, I don't uh, take glare at her, take her backpack, stick it on the scale and say, it's only 8.3 pounds. You have lied again. You know, you'll be doing the dishes all week long. So we, we understand that is hyperbole. That is hyper, that is exaggeration to say a ton. It's not literally 2000 pounds of homework, but it's, it's a, it's a way of expressing strong emotion, right? Those are genre, different genres within our, within our own culture and time. And of course, within the Bible, you have narrative, you have apocalyptic, you have poetry, you have prophetic, you have proverbs, all these different genres. Uh, and, and sometimes it's rather transparent how to interpret them. But other times, um, the ancient writers and their ancient readers had assumptions that are a little bit foreign to us, because we're talking about it, something from thousands of years ago, you know, at earliest 2000 years ago, sometimes 3000 years ago. And, um, and so sometimes we need some help to think about that a little bit more uh, deliberately. People will misuse genre, they'll misunderstand and misuse genre. And just a warning about that, number one, a few warnings about that. Number one, it can be an underhanded way of denying the truthfulness of the biblical text. And maybe you've, maybe you've heard somebody on the radio or TV and they'll say, well, you know, the gospels are just a myth or this or that. And, and of course, in saying that, that's a genre designation. They're saying rather than historical accounts, the Gospels are intending through symbolic and non-factual events, non-factual reporting to make a claim about uh, some aspect of the divine. Of course, that uh, I think that is uh, wrong. Uh, it's an underhanded way of denying the truthfulness of the text. The words of C.S. Lewis come to mind. C.S. Lewis addressed this in his day. He said, when people say that, I always want to ask them, how many myths have they read? because I've devoted my life to studying mythological literature, and I've read many, many. And when I read the Gospels, I know they're not written as myth because the way they're just the way that specific historical people and time frames and so on, it's presented. Now you can question, people can question the truthfulness or the historicity of it, but it's clearly presented as historically, historical reporting of accurate information. Secondly, misunderstanding the genre not not labeling genre correctly and interpreting it correctly can can be used to excuse oneself from the demands of scripture right this can be a misuse of genre and this this can be a danger even for seminary students seminary students can become very sophisticated disobeyers of scripture okay they can become very like the pharisees that's one of the dangers of studying theology and the bible is we can not only come to know the Bible better and come to know God, but used wrongly, we can become really sophisticated, <laughs> disobedient I people. Exit and go back in, because it's totally fine now, I can hear him. So for example, in Matthew 5.42, Jesus says, give to the one who asks from you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, um, you know, if someone comes to you and they say, I'm suicidal and I want to borrow a gun, um, you say, well, you know, I, I learned in, the, in, in taking hermeneutics that this is an example of hyperbole and Jesus doesn't give all the exceptions. And so, of course, I would never give a gun to a suicidal person. Of course, I would, if, if my child asked me for poison, I would never give them poison right it doesn't give the exceptions here but the danger is once you kind of understand oh there are exceptions to this that are not stated this is a hyperbolic teaching it doesn't say don't give something to someone when it's harmful for them or they're a minor and they don't understand okay, then don't... When, when someone comes to us with a real need rather than hearing the, de the demand of jesus to be radical in in generosity we have, we have, we excuse ourselves, right? We excuse ourselves from, from those demands. Uh, the famous Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said this, he said, Christian scholarship is the human race's prodigious invention to defend itself against the New Testament.
to ensure that one can continue to be a Christian without letting the New Testament come too close. I think probably the most dangerous for ordinary Christians like ourselves and the church is number three, the danger that in misunderstanding the genre, we might teach something wrong or misleading. You can see in parentheses underneath that, it says acts and tongues. An example will be in the book of Acts. There are many reports of people speaking in tongues and someone can take that and say, well, so if you're not speaking in tongues, then you're not really a Christian or you don't have the Holy Spirit. That takes an example of a particular description, like a description of something that happened and then turning that into a prescription without really a textual basis for that, saying everyone must do what is described here. Example I want to look at with you together is in Luke chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. So my wife and I, when we, uh, when we started um, thinking about starting a family many years ago, we listened to some audio recordings of a Bible teacher. And he, he if those of you who have children or <laughs> who've had children, you know, there's a lot of people out there giving advice about raising children. <laughs> I can assure you, I will never write a book <laughs> on raising children. I am acutely aware of my lack of gifting in speaking to that. So I'm str still struggling. I have three teenage daughters. And when people say, how are you doing? I'll usually respond as well as a man with three teenage daughters can do. <laughs> That's me right now. So though I love them dearly. Um, and so uh, the, this gentleman, you know, there's these views of, well, you know, when your kids, you need to be as close to them as you can all the time. Let them sleep in the bed with you, wear them like a chimpanzee, you know, bond with them, bond with them. And then there's the other side that's like, put them in the crib, teach them who's boss from day one, you know? <laughs> so you have these, this, this extremes, right? And we realize, I think if I just lay my cards on the table, kids are all different and there's different needs they have. And I don't think any any certain particular overriding principle is going to work for every child. But this guy was way over here, like stick him in the crib, teach him his boss day one. Let him cry. And uh, and it after he said this, you know, and I, I think it's generally husbands and wives. I think it's generally good advice not to have a baby in your in your bed uh that's very difficult to maintain uh you know intimacy as husbands and wives and it's also just uh dangerous for the child to roll over on them and uh, but he he didn't go the practical route there he said look in the bible here in luke chapter 2 verse 7 it says uh, about mary she gave birth to her firstborn a son she wrapped it wrapped him in claws and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them so see there when we have babies, we need to put them in cribs. Now you have to ask yourself, is that why Luke included this detail here, right? This is, this is the genre of historical narrative and historical narrative includes many details which are not given prescriptively. They're just told, you know, they're, they're not intent. We're not supposed to like, am I, am I supposed to actually get a feeding trough? You know, like a crib is not good enough. I mean, I want to, I want to do it like what, what kind of bed would Jesus sleep in? I mean, I was supposed to get like, and it was probably hewn out of stone. You know, I'm supposed to get like a 500 pound stone feeding trough and put my child in that. Uh, and, you know, it's, again, the question is why did Luke tell us this detail? And if you read the beginning of Luke's gospel, you read all of Luke's gospel, there's a great emphasis on the poor, the outcast, how Jesus is there for the lowly, uh, how he the his ministry to to women uh, it's a great emphasis on ministry to the sick to women to the poor people that society would not have valued highly and and this seems to tie in with that right here is the king of the universe and when he shows up he's put in a cow trough right he's put in a cow trough he's with his people he, he he's humble he comes for the humble. And, and I, I always thought it would be interesting if I had a chance to talk to the guy who, who did that teaching to point out, well, hey, look in Luke 11, verses five to seven, when Jesus tells a parable, right? This is, this is actually Jesus teaching about the guy who comes, the friend that comes to his other friend says, loan me three loaves of bread. I've had someone come here. And the answer is, don't bother me. The door's now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up 
<laughs> how can I get up and give you anything? So, I mean, you say, well, Jesus tells a story, he puts children in bed. And to be fair, probably the size of homes, probably the sleeping practices in first century Palestine, that probably was much more typical to have the family all piled in together like a bunch of meerkats in a, probably in the, you know, and when it's a hot up on top of the, the roof out there getting some breeze at night, right? But I don't think it's prescriptive there, is it? It's not like, oh, yeah, that's how we need to sleep so that we're biblical, right? The point is, it's just Jesus is telling a story using details from everyday life um, that, that it would be memorable to people. Another, just another example, I mean, we could, we could look at many of these, but um, in Proverbs 10.4, it says, lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. Now, the Proverbs tell us the way things normally work, but they don't give all the exceptions to this, right? And in fact, there are other Proverbs that speak about, you know, a, a poor laborer may work hard, but injustice sweeps away the fruit of his labor, right? So they're, they're, the Proverbs are often situational. They address situations, and, and they, tell, they don't give all the exceptions to the general patterns of the way things work in the world. This is, I'm painting with very broad strokes. But if someone doesn't understand that, they can read this proverb and say, well, if someone is poor, you know, then they must be lazy, right? Because here it says lazy hands make a man poor. And so why should I help lazy people? Paul said, if you don't work, you don't eat. So I'm, you know, and, and it, it fails to take into account all the other proverbial teaching about helping the poor is lending to the Lord give, and about the, that poverty can result from injustice or can result from laziness, right? The biblical teaching is much more nuanced and taking the Proverbs, each proverb as a, as a fail proof sort of promise. You can stick in a box and, you know, it has a lock on it and you can apply it to every situation is a misunderstanding of how proverbial uh, literature works. Okay, so let's step back and let's remember we have the structure we can walk through here. And when we walk into the first room, for me, the foyer of my house, we see the, you know, you have the disco ball, prayer hands, prayer tattoo, maybe MC Hammer, you got to pray. It's a reminder, the first step in approaching the Bible is prayer. Right to, to oh God, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things in your word. Then we go to the next room and we see that wallpaper, the stark wallpaper of all those different sporting images, judo, archery, basketball, soccer, curling, right? And we know there's different rules to the game. You got to know you, there are different genres of literature in, in the Bible. And it's like different sports almost. And you can't take the rules from one and apply it to the other. There are different genres of literature. The Bible is a, is a library. And we, we need to respect the, the genres that the authors chose. We submit ourselves to those genre decisions. Now, in the same rule, in the same room here, for me, it's just the second room, my living room. Uh, you know, again, the wall, we see the wallpaper with all those images. In your mind, I want you to see the floor is covered in sawdust, okay? The floor is covered in sawdust. And there's a bull in there, like a huge bull, like kicking. And there's a cowboy on it. As I was looking at this before meeting with y'all, I was like, I don't know how this is going to translate into Canadian culture. <laughs> I assume you guys are familiar with rodeos, right? Assume you're familiar with rodeos. But, but the image is, it, it, the, the, the point we're saying here is, is to stay on the bull, okay, to stay on the bull. And the image is of a bull and a cowboy on it. And the idea is that the word of God is a powerful and unpredictable force, right? When we come to, when we come to study a passage, we don't really know before we study it carefully where it's going to take us. Like in the same way, this cowboy didn't know where the bull was going to take. But our job is to hang on to the text to hang on to the author's meaning and to not infuse it with our own meaning, to hold on tight to the powerful word of God. To my, most of my students I teach are going to be pastors. And I tell them, you know, when you get into the pulpit, you really have two options. 
and this this is to appeal to the macho macho males in the room right you're either a bull rider or if you know how the rodeo works uh, there's only one other person out there and it's if the if the if the bull rider falls off that people dress as clowns running around trying to get the bull from stomping on people i said that's your options when you're when you're preaching or teaching this is true for sunday school teachers too right we don't want to be clowns there's some clowns we don't want to be people who are out there trying to entertain and we're like we're we got to come up with the meaning here we got to come up with no we, our job is to hold tightly to the biblical author's intent and go where that goes one time when i was teaching this i had a older lady middle-aged lady in my class from texas who was very outspoken and she just told me she's like your image doesn't work for me so i've come up with my own and she emailed me a picture of a woman in labor and it's from the the perspective of the woman's head looking down to see this large stomach and her knees are up and she's just you know grimacing focusing and she's like this is this is my image it's focus on one thing folks like okay that's cool that image does not work for me uh but i can see how it might work for you the point being i guess is is to not get distracted and not feel like but to, to say what did Isaiah, what did Paul, what did John, what did they want to teach in this text? And I want to, I want to hold on to that. Now, many times in scripture, we'll just look at a few passages, we're, we're warned and cautioned to be careful, right? In 2 Timothy 2.15, to be careful in our interpretation, it says, do your best, do your best here, Paul's writing to Timothy, but by extension, it applies to us as later Christians who read and study and teach God's word, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So I wanted you to note several things there. One, there's a call to excellence, to do your best. And many of us, there's different areas of our life, whether it's riding, you know, riding a bike or cooking cooking some sort of baked item some pie that we're everyone loves that we make or or playing golf or fixing our car whatever it is there's just something where you're like I, I i do that really well the bible calls us to be people of excellence with the word right to not do that half-heartedly or to do that sloppily but to do our best to do our best to present yourself to god because ultimately it's a matter of faithfulness to god it's because it's his word. It's he's he through his appointed spokespeople, he has spoken. And so we don't want to we, we don't want to distort his word. We don't want to twist it. We don't want to say something, say, well, God said this when he said something different, right? That would be we should be ashamed if that's the case. Like if if Chris, you know, if I were saying Chris said this, this, and he didn't and he heard me, I should be ashamed. I'd be like, oh. I'm lying. I'm, not, I'm misrepresenting him. We don't want to misrepresent God, but we want to correctly handle the word of truth, to rightly handle it. In 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, similarly, Peter writes about Paul's letters. He says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand right we admit there are some portions of scripture that are more it doesn't say they're impossible to understand they're hard to understand it says which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction notice peter doesn't say well you know paul you read his letters you might get some things that he didn't intend you know you might you might go some places that he never would have agreed with but that's cool as long as you're led by the spirit now he, he says, when you deviate from what Paul intended, that's because you're ignorant and unstable. You're distorting his word. You're distorting the apostle Paul's teaching. And if you do that severely enough, you're, you're, you're so distorting the gospel that you're teaching a false gospel, which leads to other people's and your own destruction, right? If you're teaching a false gospel, it results in other people running down the road to destruction. You're you're pointing the way to them. Now, I've had students before um, ask me, they say, well, you know, isn't 
isn't God a patient, loving father? Of course, God is a patient, loving father. Say, is it possible that early in my ministry, early in my Christian life, even for years of my Christian life, that I, that I have, you know, maybe I took a passage and, you know, I'm, I misunderstood it, but I taught it, you know, genuinely, sincerely. God is so patient with us, isn't he? He's so kind. And, and I, my, my response to them is, well, when I, one of my daughters, when she was younger, she wanted to help sweep the kitchen. I think it was my youngest one. And she got the broom, which was, you know, she was tiny, three feet tall. The broom's four or five feet tall. She started sweeping. She's banging all the kitchen cabinets, <laughs> these nice cherry kitchen cabinets, scratching them with the broom. Now, was, now she's, she was four or five or something. Yes, yeah, so I'm patient. I'm, I'm sweet. Don't do that. I went to the dollar store and bought a broom for a sawed it off, hack sawed it off and put like a rubber thing on the end so it wouldn't bang the kid. Here, try this, right? But what would I do if she came back from college and did that? She got the broom start, I'd be like, come on, you're 19 years old, you know, it's, it, if you're five. So yeah, God is patient with us, but he wants us to grow, doesn't he? He doesn't want us to just stay with a sloppy or, you know, incorrect interpretation he wants us to grow so that we we could correctly handle the word of truth to not be ashamed before him to 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 not distort the scriptures he's calling us to maturity in that a couple of um definitions that might be helpful in this as we think about this the holding tightly to the bull stay on the bull <laughs> is uh, we're going to distinguish two definitions i'm drawing these from one of my mentors robert stein Meaning is the paradigm or principle the author consciously willed to convey by the shareable symbols he or she used. This was it. What did Paul mean when he wrote this? What did Ezekiel mean when he reported this? And we distinguish that from the implications. And these are the sub, sub meanings of a text that legitimately fall within the paradigm or principle will by the author, whether he or she was aware of them or not. So let me, that may seem a little abstract. Let's make it more concrete. So Stein, the one who uses these definitions, the, the verse he always uses to illustrate these is Ephesians 5.18, which I think is good. Ephesians 5.18 says, do not get drunk with wine. <clears throat> so when Paul wrote that to the Ephesians, he was telling them um, to not get drunk with fermented grape juice, right? With grape juice from grapes that had been fermented, so it had an alcohol content. Well, what, what would it, what do you think Paul, the apostle Paul would say if he showed up in Ephesus and they were all drunk and, 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 uh, he might say, Hey, didn't I, didn't I write to you? Don't get drunk with wine. And they say, well, of course we've, we, we haven't gotten drunk with wine ever since we got that. Left. We only get drunk with beer now. And, and would, would Paul, would he say, Oh, you know, my my bad, my fault. I should have been a little more clear there. Um, don't get drunk with with wine or with beer. And then, of course, there throughout the history of the world, there are all sorts of fermented uh, beverages for, based on all kinds of fruits and vegetables. And so, would would Paul have had to list all of those? Of course not, right? It, there there's a principle there about taking into your body something that so distorts your perspective that you dishonor yourself and dishonor others, that you disobey God, that you um, do shameful or exploitive things. Don't, don't take any such substance into your body that would cause you to do that, right? There's, the, there's a principle there that has all kinds of implications for substances that did not exist when Paul uh, originally wrote that. We could think of another example. For example, in Proverbs 11, 1. In Proverbs 11, 1, we read, The Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate weights are his delight. Now, I'm trying to lose a little co extra COVID weight right now, you know? And so if I read this, I might say, yeah, I don't like those dishonest scales either. I get on them and they make me look fatter than I am. But that's, that's not what this is about, is it? Think about it. This is written 3,000 years ago. And what were scales used for 3,000 years ago? They were used to weigh agricultural produce. They were used to weigh precious metals, right? And 
it's the, this proverb, if you look at it, interestingly, it's just a factual statement. God hates dishonest scales, but he delights in accurate weights. And so I don't know if, if you've ever visited a country where, you know, in the marketplace, people just weigh the produce, but some of you probably have Malaysia or Mexico or something, and they just have this little scale and they'll put like for on one side, they'll put a five kilo weight. And then on the other side, they'll pile up mangoes until they they are equal, and then they'll sell you five kilos of, of mangoes. But what if that five kilo weight really only weighs four and a half kilos? What if it's hollow in the middle? Well, that's a dishonest scale. It's basically cheating, isn't it? It's it's a way, or it's it kind of glitched for a second. Are we still good, Chris? You can hear me? Okay. The uh, it's a way of cheating. It's a dishonest, and so. Um, probably if we took a poll i'm guessing that maybe only three or four of you use scales in your business right maybe some of you do maybe some of you run a grocery store some of you are farmers uh, but does that mean this doesn't apply to 95 percent of us uh, you know or or is there a principle the principle here is just about honesty in business isn't it so if you build decks you and you say we use treated lumber you don't use untreated lumber if you sell cars you don't roll back the odometer if you work at a restaurant you don't get someone to check you in five minutes before you get there and five minutes after so you get more this it's an issue of god delights when we treat others honestly in our business now we're building up it's hard to do this piecemeal but we're building up to to the point that we're going to point out that every scripture is also an invitation to point to Christ. And so every scripture like this searches us and, and we're reminded of our disobedience or we're reminded of where we hedged things. We sort of spun information a certain way. And it's all, it's a call to repentance and it's a call to trust on the day of judgment. We don't show up and say, God, I've never been dishonest in any way. I've, we say, God, you know all the ways that I've fudged the truth. You know all the ways that I had to go back and apologize. And I trust not in my own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ, right? So each one of these, or think about, you know, it's, again, it's hard to do this piecemeal, but the Ephesians 5.18, don't get drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the spirit, right? There's, there's the human condition. There's an emptiness in us. This is so clear in the pandemic so sad i had a neighbor uh on our street where you could just see the recycling bin filled with alcohol bottles you know seeking to seeking to fill the emptiness of their soul when they were isolated in this way right there's a it, it, but rather rather than that we cut it's a call to come to god and say god i've sought so many different ways to fill the emptiness of my soul but only the gift of your spirit, which comes through Christ, your son, who died for me. Only you, the triune God, saving and filling me will satisfy me, right? So we, we're, not, we're not teaching moralism here, right? Each one of these passages is instructive about how to live as a, as a follower of Jesus, but it's also a call to trust in Christ's finished work. Um, I guess maybe I'll look at one other passage. I, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to go over my time. But uh, a number of years ago, uh, it's been quite a few years now. My wife and I we bought our first house here in Kentucky, and uh, as we were meeting with the lady who lived in that house, she, there was a husband, and wife, and children, and the lady was in the midst of coming to Christian faith. It was really beautiful to see and. In the providence of God, we were supposed to buy that house, I think partly so that we could get to know her and have this relationship with her. And um, she attended a, uh, a very liberal church in town, but she didn't really have categories for, for it. She's like, I'm at this church. And, and she, she, she got us there late one night and she's hide is my wife and I were there with her. And she's like, I just have to ask you a question. The pastor, he preached on Matthew 13. She pulled out her Bible. We looked at it. The parable of the weeds says the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. 
The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And she said, uh, you know, he, he read that, and then he preached a sermon where he told us each one of us have wheat in our lives and weeds, and we need to pull the weeds out and cultivate the wheat. She said, but I kept reading my Bible, again, <laughs> rather naive woman here says, I kept reading my Bible. And then Jesus explains the parable down here in verse 36. And the weeds are people who are pulled up and thrown into hell. She's, she's like, what? What is going on? I mean, literally, she didn't understand. She just was just like, didn't have a category. I said, well, I was just very honest. I said, well, what I know of your church, um, the idea of hell and eternal punishment is a very unpalatable idea. In other words, the preacher, if he were to teach on that, um, what Jesus taught, he would be uh, not very popular. The, the congregation would not like it. Is if he were to teach like that regularly, he would get fired or run out. And so he has taken the teaching of Jesus, and he is not respecting what Jesus intended. He is not, we could use in our language, he's not holding tightly to the bull, to the author's intent here. He's instead, he's infusing it with his own meaning that is something that he thinks the people in the congregation will not be offended by and maybe that he thinks would be helped to give to be charitable maybe he thinks it would be helpful to them but it's not um it's not what's intended by matthew who recorded this it's not what clearly what not what's intended by jesus who originally spoke the parable um to his disciples so let's let's review because we're right at seven o'clock so i want to pause for some time for questions but just reviewing as, as we walk through this room. And I want you sometime this week to think about this a couple of times and just to keep the structure in your mind because we're going to keep filling it out uh, next week. So we walk in the first room, right? The disco ball, prayer hands on the wall, prayer tattoo, maybe prayer, you got to pray music, right? We The first step in interpreting the Bible is to say, oh God, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things in your word. And, and a great way to do that is have Psalm 119, have highlighted verses, read them aloud, make them your own prayer. At the same time, confess, um, confess what God brings to mind as you read those. The next room, we have the, the wallpaper, all the different sports, judo, soccer, basketball, curling. And, and we know when we approach the Bible, it's like a library with lots of different genres. And we need to know the rules of the game to respect the, the literary rules of those different genres and not just pick some detail out of the narrative and say, so you have to do this too, speaking in tongues or putting your kid in a crib or, or we don't take a proverb and make it into a promise and then beat people up with it uh, in a way that it was never intended. So, and then in the same room, right, we have a if, if you the more senses you involve the better so you, you can smell it smells like the state fair it smells like the kentucky state fair you got the sawdust you got the bull kicking around right stay on the bull hold tightly hold tightly to the biblical author's intent we don't want to bring our own meaning we want to follow the biblical inspired biblical authors mean that and then when we really understand that that will enable us to faithfully find the implications if we don't really understand the meaning, we can't flow out of that very clearly to the implications. We'll, we'll pick up with some more examples of, of uh, biblical authors' intent next week, but I'm going to pause here and just take um, any questions or comments, anything you guys want to say. Dr. Plummer, while people are queuing up for questions, I have a couple questions that I'm thinking of, and one of them comes from maybe the literary genre, if we drive a little deeper in that, and perhaps the biblical author's intent, if I can link those two together for a second. Um, when you're at seminary, you spend a lot of time learning things like genres and, and how to identify them and, and such. And anything you can encourage the people on the line tonight to how to recognize different genres, firstly, um, and yeah. then... 
and then kind of how to what tools do you sort of help people in terms of determining the biblical author's intent that you can kind of guide us in? Yeah, so, well, um, in, in terms of determining genre, I do think most people, I mean, there is a, it's not, it's not like we're reading, you know, a language from another planet, right? We, we do, a, many people are, have been reading the Bible for many years. So the most common genre in the Bible is historical narrative, is just over half of the Bible is just reporting things that happened in history. And really, I mean, we, in, in a book like my 40 questions book or in a, in a study Bible, in any other book related to hermeneutics, they'll give you some points on that. Like, Hey, listen to the, uh, the authors explicit, you know, when they step out of the narrative and they give an explanatory comment, or there's certain character, there's certain characters in the narrative who are to be trusted, the structure, what's repeated, what occurs at the beginning. And there are all these kinds of things, but really, if we can just summarize that simply, it's just reading it carefully, really. It's reading it carefully with the question, what does this biblical author want me to believe and do? What is he, he teaching me about God? Now, to be fair, there are some genres that are a little trickier, right? Like apocalyptic, which would be sections of Ezekiel and Daniel, and of course, the well-known book of Revelation. And I do think I do think the book of Revelation is such a different genre from what we're familiar with that we really could, most people need help to understand it the way that John, the author of the Apocalypse of John, Revelation wants us to understand it. It'd be like if we went back in time and we showed a documentary to the Apostle Paul and you know they're jumping around in someone's life and they're fade out scenes. I mean, I think it'd be very confusing for him. He'd be like, wait, I thought, how old is this person? Why are we, why are we talking about them when they're 12? You know, like just things that we intuitively, because we've watched documentaries and movies, we, we understand. So again, in any good study Bible, the ESV study Bible, the NIV study Bible, the Christian standard Bible study Bible, um, would at the beginning of those books, we'll have brief discussions and explanations of the author's assumptions about their genre any little basic book on interpreting the Bible, like my 40 questions book, and there are other ones out there, Gordon Fee's How to Study the Bible for All It's Worth, any, any book like that, we'll, we'll discuss those. So it's a good question. So let, let me just cue it up so others can ask. And while they're doing that, um, so if you're muted on your screen in front of you, just click on the bottom left where the microphone is and or feel free to click chat if you don't wish to ask a question you want me to do it for you. Just click on the chat and key that in. Now, while we're waiting for that, I have one more quick question. In your book, 40 Questions, um, you have an entire chapter dedicated to does the Bible contain error? Uh, and so I think this is one that many people um, or, you know, you can talk about the translation therein, which are interconnectedness. And so any thoughts on, and obviously your two chapters will discuss that, but just at a very high level, you know, in the transmission from original language, and you're one of the better Greek scholars, I would say, in the world and teachers, um, how do we, with the English version, have the confidence that what we're reading is in what the author and what God ultimately intended it? to be. Yeah, well, it's hard to give a short answer to that, but I'll try, right? The, it, it's a very good question. Uh, I, I mean, just to lay on my cards on the table where I'm coming from, I believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God. So I do not believe it has any mistakes in it. And um, I believe that when I'm talking to someone, if that's an issue for them, it's best usually to address particular situations. Like, well, what is it that's bothering you? Let's talk about that. And, and many times it deals with phenomenological language or it deals with um, partial reporting. You say, well, in this gospel, it says two people and this gospel says one. You say, well, I mean, <laughs> it just, that doesn't mean that they're contradictory. It means that the authors are, for whatever reason, many times they have a literary reason, they're choosing to leave out some details of the narrative. And so it's best, I think, to address those in, in, and in the chapter, I give some specific examples and there and, and also other resources that deal with that in, 
detail. Now, I would say never in the history of the world have we had as many great translations. I mean, the English language, we have an embarrassing wealth of excellent translations. Some of them are more word for word, some of them are more thought for thought, but the ESV, the NASB, the NIV, the CSB, I mean, they're, they're the NLT, we have great translations. Now, every translation at points has to make decisions where there can be a loss of nuance. They to translate it into normal English, there can be, and study Bibles will many times try to provide additional information on that. But of course, it's, um, I mean, I'm a big fan of people learning to read Greek and Hebrew, even lay people. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think, again, we have great translations, but it's never been easier. So if you, if you want to learn Greek and Hebrew, they're free lessons at uh, Daily Dose of Hebrew and Daily Dose of Greek. Any, I've got people, lay people all over the world, construction workers, retired mathematicians, homeschooling moms who are learning and reading the Bible in Greek and Hebrew, and you can do it too. Again, dailydoseofhebrew.com and dailydoseofgreek.com. I, I did see, if you don't mind, Chris, I see I have a, a direct message from someone who sent me, and th it says, when referencing verses from Proverbs, would Proverbs be part of their own genre under wisdom literature, and if so, would have their own rules of interpretation? The short answer is yes. So wisdom literature involves both Proverbs and it involves kind of um, within the Bible. It also involves like uh, the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of, of Job. And so you have kind of these monologues like Job and Ecclesiastes, which often look at the, except. if you think about it, Ecclesiastes and Job are often looking at the exceptions to Proverbs, right? So Job, here's a righteous man, but all these terrible things happen. But it's not because he's done, it's not like God is punishing him for some sin. That it's Job's comforters, comforters in quotations, are really basically saying, look, you're suffering, so you must be a sinner. So they're they're misun, it's like they're taking the Proverbs and and applying them wrongly. So yeah, there's a broader body of wisdom literature, which even involves the Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Job, Proverbs, and and each one of those kind of provides a different perspective on the nitty gritty of life and they balance each other to give a full a full view of that so that's a good question and then one other question um from uh someone said how long did it take you to master this method of memorizing how long do you find it takes someone to dedicate i i don't know that i would never claim that i've mastered this method of memorizing but it's very effective and it's it's if you can use i've used it to teach my kids to memorize stuff at their school and and it just the human is wired to remember things visually and that's also it's so distressing when people you know the world we live in has a lot of a lot of uh um, images that we should not see and it's distressing for people who who fill their minds with images that later they they greatly regret because it's difficult to erase them right but used rightly the 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 memorization ability and the the mind for images that god has given us can be a wonderful way to learn i'll mention to you there's a there's a website mullenmemory.com mullenmemory.com it's free and this is started by a guy who was a medical student who discovered this mnemonic method of memory palaces and word association and uh, he has all kinds of little free videos on there about how to use specifically a memory palace um to remember things mullenmemory.com little three and five minute videos and stuff like that chris sorry back to you bro thank you i want to pause just to see if anybody has a live question here Don't forget, you just click on the bottom left on your microphone to talk, please. I have one more question, but I want to allow others to ask. So ethical question, is it okay to wear a Canadian maple flag shirt when traveling overseas as an American in hopes that people will think I'm Canadian? Is that dishonest? <laughs> So, because they'll treat me better. Okay. Oh yeah, there we got a Canadian. If I could just borrow that hat, 
<laughs> Bill, if you could send that to Dr. Plummer, we'd appreciate that. Yeah, just kidding. Go, Chris, what's your question? Okay, so I, and I'm sorry to dominate the questions, but I love learning from you. So in your book, I want to go back into there. Um, a question I've been asked, I'll give you a two-part one to finish off, and then we'll pray for tonight. So you mentioned different versions of the English Bible. Um, can you give us just very briefly kind of the range of the spectrum and why, if we're uh, teaching, if we're preaching, if we're reading, what the different versions do and how we harmonize those so we can read God's word better will be my first part, but I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me start with a, with an illustration. So I see, I love your congregation here. I see people from all over the, you know, all different ethnic backgrounds and ages, and that's beautiful. I'm guessing a few of them are Chinese. I could be wrong. And I lived in China for a year. Uh, and in China, when one of the greetings that was very common when I was there was Nichilama, which literally means, have you eaten? Um, but when you ask someone that it doesn't, you don't really care whether they've eaten or not. It's just to something you say <laughs> and people will say back Chula, yeah, I've eaten or no, they have, you know, boot, boot or something like that. And, and so when my wife, when we were involved in a Chinese church here in Louisville, the pastor called once and asked if she'd eaten. And she's so just, she's like, is he want to invite us to supper or what's going on? And, <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 he doesn't care about that. It's just, it's just a greeting. Right. So you can imagine if, if I went to China and I were leading people and someone said this, I could translate, I could say, he's asking if you've eaten. Well, that'd be a very literal translation, a very word for word, new American standard. And there could be a reason for that kind of, you know, ESV, but I could also recognize, you know, these people may have trouble understanding the function of this phrase. So I'm just going to say, he's really glad you're here. How, how, how's it going? <laughs> you know, that would be more of the New Living Translation, where it's like this is functionally equivalent in the other language. So there's a spectrum there. Like it, it formally, it's called formally equivalent and functionally equivalent. So formally equivalent, you try to keep the same number of words, the same literalness of the expression. Whereas the functional equivalent is talking more about meaning for meaning, you know, to convey, to, and you especially see that the reason I chose an, Id, an idiom, it's especially um, clear in idioms. I mean, just to, to be a little bit crass, I don't know if I should use this example, but I'm going to. So in Hebrew, there's an expression for men, an idiom for a man, that is a male person, is literally the expression is one that pees against a wall. Like that's what it means. And so you, if you have like a King James version, maybe you, you've heard this, like it'll say they conquered the city and there was not left one that pisseth against the wall. In other words, there's not left one man left in that town. I mean, that's, but, but you'll notice most English, modern English translations think that's a little weird and distracting to word. So they'll just say it was not left a single man uh, in the town, which I think, I think it's a great, a great choice. <laughs> so, but that's especially, you can see that word for word versus meaning for meaning in, in idiomatic, but it, it, it touches on other things too. Uh, depending on whether one is intending to like work phrase by phrase through, you know, through carefully in an in a exegetical study, or they're, they're giving a Bible to someone who's never read the Bible before, or giving a Bible to an eighth grader, you know, those different translations can really be useful in different purposes, in different places. So I, I'm a big fan of every Bible translation that's not done by a cult, okay? I'm not a fan of Bible translations done by cults that are trying to change the meaning of the Bible. One's done by Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. Those are bad. But every other major Bible translation, people can quibble about they should have done this or not done that. But I think that, you know, they're, they're rightly seeking to convey the the biblical teaching and we we can talk more on that next time if if you want to but uh go ahead chris thank you that is not the answer i was expecting or at least not but i, I appreciate that pisseth against the wall <laughs> yeah, yeah, but i appreciate i appreciate i will not forget that um the question we got two questions here that have been asked and we're, i'm sensitive for time so i want to be careful we don't go much further. One was, can we get a copy of this recording? And yes, we will have this posted 
onto our website, but I want to show you why this method works. So my first day of class, going back to the Legacy Hotel, I walked and talked to Don, and I remember going into the hotel room on the third floor, and I went through all seven of those images and the point of it. And the next day, I recalled all seven. And the next day, I recalled all seven. And ironically, here we are six and a half years later, and I almost can recall verbatim that day. And so this method works, and you'll be shocked at how effective putting images to God's word. And, you know, tonight we covered, uh, you know, obviously we started with, with prayer and then, and then knowing the rules of the game. Right. So those two images and, you know, staying on the bull, although it's not much of a Canadian expression, it resonates. And so, you know, again, I just want to attest that this not only works on this call, it's working for many, many years. And this method is powerful. Um, the second question here, and we'll finish with this one before we go to prayers is how would you, Dr. Plummer, classify the creation story in terms of a genre? Yeah, well, I mean, I think God literally created the world by speaking it into existence, you know, I, and there was a literal Adam and Eve. So, uh, but I mean, it's, I think that's a historical narrative, but I, I would, if I, if I want to give a more detailed account, I would admit that it's written in a poetic fashion, right? It's, there was evening, there was morning the first day, there was evening, there was morning the second day. There was, I mean, it's, it's written in a, in a poetic way. And so the question is, why is it written that way? Is it, in, you know, what is the purpose in doing that? Um, and genuine Christians, I, I don't know if I'm stepping into a beehive in your church, but genuine Christians will disagree, you know, sometimes about the age of the earth, and they'll disagree how much of this is intended to be, you know, the poetic structure here is intended to convey time periods versus particular 24-hour days. Um, so I, I I do think Christians can disagree on that. I think what's what's uh, non-negotiable is that God, I mean, you read the text, it's clear God created everything outside of himself. <laughs> and I do think it's very difficult to read Genesis and read Revelation and not think that the authors believe that Adam and Eve were historical people who rebelled against God in space and time. You know, that that, that was an event that happened in the past. And that's the reason that we as a human species Though we reflect the image of God, we are we live in a very broken world, and we are, we're personally broken and sinful because of great 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 grandmother Eve and great 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 grandfather Adam, who introduced sin into the world. So. Well, thank you, Dr. Plummer. Um, just to reiterate, Jamie in the chat has put up the following comment. He said the video will be found at westhighland.org. Um, backslash trek and uh, we will also proactively send out to all the participants after we're done the two sessions the links to this as well so you can go back and review i just want to thank you i hope everybody's just as excited as i am to get to part two next week and i just want to close us in prayer tonight and thank you again dr Plummer. dear god your word is rich and the closer we get to it, the more that we sometimes feel, the less we understand, but the more that we are conformed to become like you. And so, God, we just pray that as each of us are trying to rightly handle the word of truth, that we spend the needed time in prayer, firstly, that we truly try to understand as best as we can the rules associated to the different books that we're in. Dr. Plummer has tonight described the Bible as, you know, a library with 66 books to check out and to read from. Uh, what a wonderful image. You are so rich. Your word is so rich. The tapestry is so complex and so beautiful. And when we stand back, we see Christ from cover to cover, and we are so thankful that you have saved us, God. Thank you for Dr. Plummer tonight, taking time away from his wonderful family to invest into our church at West Highland, and we just eagerly look forward to next week, uh, if we're able, Lord, to continue to study your word and to treasure it in our hearts and our minds so that we love you more and love others as a result. 
we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. God bless. And we will talk to you next Sunday, Lord willing.